Thank you, Tom and uh, William and everybody else from MAUDC and those of you participating in tonight's uh, meeting. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, when, and because Tom's giving me the, um, this space to uh, talk a little bit about myself, uh, I'll also um, kind of do a little bit of a preamble about tonight's discussion. Um, so I am a, a classically trained fungal ecologist. Uh, I've been teaching a, about fungi for good golly um, since the early 2000s, so going on 20 plus years. And a lot has changed in those uh, 20 years with respect to fungi. And um, I've, uh, up until very recently, um, when I moved from Northern Virginia to New York State, um, I had been serving for um, probably the last four years. Um, Mitch and William, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is the MA um, DC Scientific Advisor, uh, which has been a real pleasure if there's uh, any regret that I have uh, about moving from Northern Virginia to um, the Finger Lakes region in New York, it's that uh, I will no longer be serving in that capacity. But Ma is incredibly lucky um, to be having uh, uh, Megan Romberg um, as their incoming scientific advisor. Um, you won't be disappointed, that's for sure. And uh, you should all really look forward to her talk next month. Uh, and so, when I've given several talks at um, different uh, venues for MA, both at the uh, monthly meetings as well as Sequinota, um, when Tom approached me about giving a talk, he suggested um, uh, talking about fungal reproduction. And my first response was like, are you sure? And, um, and so depending on how things go, um, if it goes terribly awry, we can collectively agree that it's all Tom's fault for picking this particular topic. If things go well, we'll, um, we'll thank the presenter, right? Because that's just how uh, things tend to go. So when I was thinking about how to title tonight's talk, um, I thought I was being particularly clever by um, giving a nod to mushroom guru David Aurora and and titling it Mushrooms Demystified. And then I thought, well, you know, that's a pretty ambitious claim to, um, to paste on a, um, uh, a title that's really about um, a very narrow topic in the kingdom fungi. And so I retitled it um, Mushroom Reprodu Reproduction Demystified. However, based on William's earlier comments, I think I'm gonna retitle this slide and, and call it uh, mushroom sluts and other whores of, the, of kingdom fungi. That is certainly a much better title. So thank you, William. I would have never come up with that on my own. And uh, going forward, if I give this again, I will give you due credit for that amazing title. Um, what you'll see in the background is um, a very common mushroom that I'll be referring to in, on multiple occasions throughout tonight's talk. And that's Schizophilium, Schizophilium uh, commune, also known as the slit gill fungus, probably um, the best known mushroom slut out there. So this is going to be a pretty deep and intense talk. If you have questions, please post them uh, to the chat. And Matt, um, members of the MAW board, um, will raise those questions. I'll also check in at multiple points, and I expect there to be quite a few questions. Again, this is a pretty um, deep talk it, topic to talk about um, to a really diverse audience. So um, I appreciate your, um, your interest and your patience, and uh, buckle up and let's get started. So um, when we talk about um, fungi, we're talking about um, a really uh, diverse group of organisms. Um, at present, there's about 144,000 uh, named and classified fungi. Um, this being said, um, it's estimated that the vast majority of fungi, meaning well over 90%, of fungal sp species are actually unknown to science. So we're talking about a really slim sl slice of the fungal pie here. Um, the latest best estimate 
suggests that the total number of fungal species that um, potentially exist on Earth hovers somewhere between 2.2 and 3.8 million species. Just to reiterate, we've identified 144,000 of that potential pool of fungal organisms. Um, and of those that are currently known to science, approximately 90% of those are classified as higher fungi. And by higher fungi, we're talking about those um, in the predominantly mushroom forming category. So those that would be classified into the phylum Decidiomycota or Ascomycota. So the remainder phyla that are presented here, we're not even, uh, we've really just touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, and in this phylogenetic tree that I presented, which is based on our current understanding, and some of you might, um, that are more familiar with um, uh, uh, fungal classification might be wondering what happened to the zygomycota, um, what happened to the glomeromycota, um, and so um, I don't really want to spend too much time talking about the, um, the current classification system or the phyla of fungi, um, other than to say that things are in a lot of flux with respect to where these fungi actually belong. Um, but what you are seeing, not only is our current understanding of where the fungi that, uh, that we know about belong, um, but what it does is demonstrate the relatedness or kinship um, to each other, as well as to the next closely related kingdom, which is, the, which is the animal kingdom. Furthermore, and more germane to tonight's topic, um, each of these phyla um, is distinguished by its sexual reproductive structures, life cycles, and the amount of time spent in each of those phases of their respective life cycles. So to talk about um, uh, fungal reproduction in a general term is, um, is a big challenge. And so tonight we're going to take a very narrow focus approach to fungal reproduction and really um, zero in on um, the higher fungi or those that belong um, to what's been proposed as a sub-kingdom, the dicaria the Basidiomycota and the Ascomycota. And in all honesty, due to time, um, we're really just gonna focus in on uh, fungi of the Basidiomycota. And for those of you that have not heard of um, this uh, proposed uh, subphylum dicaria, um, this um, is based on fungi, um, both from the Basidiomycota and Ascomycota, uh, coda that refers to um, cells, um, and fungal cells are called hyphae, that contain two nuclei um, as a result of um, sexual reproduction, which again is going to be um, a major topic uh, of tonight's discussion. So when we talk about um, members of, again, principally um, phylum Basidiomycota. We're not going to talk about all of the Basidiomycetes that are out there. Tom did a really great job of talking about one member of Basidiomycota, um, but there are three very broad groups that can be broken down uh, by subphyla. The subphylum Agaricomycotina, which are our mushrooms, subphylum Puccinio-mycotina, which are rusts, and subphylum Eustilaginomycotina, which are smuts. And I don't know if you recall, but um, Tom and I uh, must uh, use uh, a similar um, search keywords because we're using the exact same image um, for our um, smut-producing uh, fungi on corn. So in order to really um, do a, um, a thorough and comprehensive dive into uh, reproduction in the basidiomycetes, um, we're going to, again, narrow our, um, our focus a little bit more. And really, we're going to talk about um, fungi um, that are not part of um, 
the Russ or SMUT group. Rather, um, tonight's discussion is really going to focus on mushroom producing fungi and their reproductive behaviors. Uh, I'm going to touch on some uh, features of um, ascomycetes, but by and large, um, and so you can be assured that if I'm talking about something that's not related to mushroom producing fungi in the basidiomycetes, uh, I will um, uh, specifically call that out. So um, before we go on, I'd like to take a moment just to kind of take the temperature of the crowd. I was uh, explaining before we got started in our pre-meeting that, um, you know, these uh, virtual meetings are a fantastic way to connect with um, an audience that would otherwise um, not have um, access to this sort of um, presentation. But um, as a presenter, it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. I'm very used to reading a room and seeing uh, looks of puzzlement and question on people's face to know whether or not what I've just said uh, has resonated and has been clear. And that is mostly uh, not possible in this environment. So I'm gonna really rely on you to share any questions you might have with Elizabeth and Matt so um, they can uh, pass those on to me. So um, how are we doing so far? No questions? So far, just some words of sympathy from other teachers. <laughs> Oh, well, I really appreciate that, you know, when um, and that helps to buoy the spirit, that's for sure. So um, let's keep going, and um, we're going to um, get right down to business and start talking about some pretty um, complicated material, um, and we're going to begin this um, conversation outside of the kingdom fungi, but in a very closely related kingdom. Um, we're gonna review some important um, genetic concepts and terminology, and then apply those concepts to sexual reproduction production inher and inheritance in humans. Um, I feel it's a good idea for everybody to have um, a solid grounding before we dive into um, these con concepts in the fungal kingdom. Uh, so that we all know what the heck it is that I'm talking about. I think Tom did a great job talking about haploids and diploids, um, but I can imagine that there are more than a few of you out there that are really wondering what the heck all of that means. So let's get started with that. So um, let's talk, let's start by talking about um, how, uh, traits and characteristics are inherited. Um, we're not gonna go deeply into that um, when we talk about um, reproduction in fungi, but how fungi reproduce is inherently tied to genes that are found on chromosomes. And so um, I'm sure that everybody has a basic working knowledge of what a chromosome is and what a gene is, but let's kind of put that into a little bit more of a fine relief so that we all um, are moving forward with the same uh, understanding. And so um, a chromosome, at least in most eukaryotes, and for example, um, both fungi and animals like ourselves are eukaryotic, meaning that our DNA is surrounded by a nuclear membrane. Um, and so in a eukaryotic, eukaryotic organisms like ourselves and like our very, very distant cousins, fungi. Um, chromosomes are these thread-like uh, uh, structures that are composed of uh, molecules of DNA and proteins. Um, and it's on these uh, uh, chromosomes that um, our genetic code is carried. And these um, codes are um, typically um, in the form of genes, which are the functional uh, portions of the DNA. So not all um, DNA within a chromosome actually codes or um, determines specific traits. And so, but genes are those areas within a chromosome that do. And so um, in the graphic that I've provided, um, you'll see that I've, um, you know, and this is just uh, 
um, an arbitrary model, I've included um, two different genes, one for eye color and one for hairline type. And, um, and each one of us inherits one chromosome from one parent and another chromosome from the, the other parent. And it's these um, genes that have different variants or alleles, um, which allow us to display um, our characteristics. And so in the case of eye color, an individual might inherit um, an allele for brown eyes from one parent and blue eyes from another. Or in the case of hairline, they might inherit um, a straight hairline from one parent and a widow peak from another. And, uh, but basically every physical um, attribute that you see, along with plenty of other attributes that you don't, um, are encoded in these genes. And genes are not randomly located or placed on a chromosome. They occur on very specific chromosomes and at very specific places on a chromosome. And so when you, uh, when you hear the term locus, what we're referring to is the position of a gene on a specific chromosome. And oftentimes um, the terms gene, allele, and locus or loci um, can be interchanged, but what we're fundamentally talking about is that particular area that codes for a specific trait um, and a specific location on a specific gene. Um, and of additional importance is how these genes are inherited. Some genes are linked, meaning that they have a very high lock likelihood of, um, if not 100% likelihood of being inherited together due to their physical proximity on the chromosome. So imagine that there is a gene um, directly next to that of the eye color. The likelihood that that gene would be inherited right along with eye color would be very high because it's unlikely that those, um, uh, those genes could um, independently um, uh, segregate from, from one another during uh, uh, sexual reproduction. Unlinked genes, on the other hand, are um, often inherited independently, and that's because they are either um, far away from each other on a given chrom chromosome, or um, on the other hand, are on completely different chromosomes. And so um, therefore, um, it's unlikely that one, the gene being located in one area on one chromosome has any impact uh, on the gene in another area. And just as a kind of a very broad generalization, um, most organisms have many more genes than they have chromosomes. For example, in humans, we have about 19,000 genes on 23 chromosomes. And um, uh, in comparison to a, um, a, a very um, popular uh, organism that's, um, that's studied in genetic labs, the fruit fly, uh, has uh, a roughly 13,000 chromosomes on only, or 13,000 genes on only four chromosomes. And so to think about this in the context of the organisms that we're interested in tonight, uh, brewer's yeast, one of the um, more simple of uh, members of kingdom fungi, um, has roughly um, a little more than 6,000 genes on um, 16 chromosomes. While um, Schizophyllum commune, the split gill that I showed at the beginning, um, has um, over 13,000 on 14 different chromosomes. And our common button mushroom that you buy in the grocery store um, has about 11,000 genes on 13 chromosomes. And so uh, fungi, um, though not as um, complex in some respects as higher eukaryotes like uh, humans, um, they do possess numerous chromosomes and several thousand genes. So we're talking about um, uh, a, a pretty complex system here when we're talking about um, genetics of fungi. So um, any questions about the terms or the examples that I've provided so far? Good to go? Well, let's put this, Elizabeth, was there a question? No, I think we're good. Okay. So 
let's now talk about chromosomes in humans and, um, and take this to a slightly different perspective of what it means to have cells that are diploid versus cells that are haploid. And so in humans, whether you're male or female, um, we all have 23 pairs of different chromosomes in our diploid cells. So that means that we have uh, 22 pairs of what we refer to as autosomes and a single pair of sex chromosomes. And so in total, while there's only 23 different types of chromosomes, we have 46 total chromosomes within all of our cells that are diploid. And I'll, uh, in just a moment, I'll discuss what those cells are compared to cells in our body that are haploid, which means that they only have a single representative chromosome from each pair. So haploid cells in the case of human cells have only 23 chromosomes. And it's not just any 23 chromosomes, it has to be um, one of each of the, of the 23 different types of chromosomes. And so haploid cells have both pairs, so one from the maternal um, contributor and one from the paternal contributor. So in, for the example in chromosome one, uh, um, those are the exact same chromosomes known as homologous, meaning that they're the same. And one came from the father and one came from the mother. Um, in haploid cells, only one of those um, chromosomes would be present. And um, the vast majority of cells in the human body are diploid. And we'll talk about how that condition is, um, uh, occurs and how that is uh, maintained in, uh, in our cells. And there's a very specific type of cell in our body that actually only has half the number of chromosomes. And so some of you may already know the answer to the question that I'm going to pose, but what cells in our body have only half of the number of chromosomes uh, that's required for uh, a normal functioning human adult? So think on that for just a moment, post your, um, your thoughts and ideas on the chat and uh, we'll see if you're if you got it right in just a moment. So these cellular conditions being diploid or haploid are uh, able to perpetuate due to different types of cell division. Those different types of cell division include uh, meiosis and mitosis. And we're not going to go through all of the steps that involve duplication of chromosomes and the various different um, phases that occur in, in cellular division. What I really want you to focus on in meiosis is that we start with a um, diploid cell, meaning that the um, full complement of paired chromosomes are present. But what we end up with is our, um, from that one single diploid cell are four haploid cells um, that have half of the nuclear complement that the starting parent cell began with. And this particular cell type, so for those of you that answered on the chat, um, in uh, humans as well as uh, many other animals, are our sex cells or our gametes. And um, these cells are um, to be a little less technical, our, um, our eggs if we're female and our sperm if we're male. In, uh, and so it's only within those sex cells that um, the cells in our body are haploid. All the other cells, whether they're your skin cells or heart cells or liver, liver cells or toenail cells, um, they are all uh, diploid. Every other cell in your body, diploid, sex cells, Haploid. And this is going to be a, um, a big distinction um, with members of kingdom fungi, or at least the members of kingdom fungi that we're going to talk about tonight. So how do you, all of your other cells um, uh, reproduce? So what happens when you get a, a cut on your hand and um, 
that cup begins to heal, well, cells begin to um, be produced, and that process is um, occurs through mitotic di division. And again, we're not going to go through all the steps and stages and phases involved in mitosis. But uh, what I want you to uh, keep in mind is that um, what we start with, that diploid cell, so both processes start with um, diploid cells, but what we end up with is exactly the same with what we started, but times two. So from a single diploid cell, we end up with two diploid cells. And so um, these two processes, whether they occur in animals like humans or in the fungi we're gonna be talking tonight, the same steps occur um, in order for these types of cells, haploid cells and diploid cells to be produced. And so just as kind of, um, a little bit of a, a test to see if you were paying attention. Um, so how many chromosomes do, uh, does a 2N or diploid cell have versus a 1N or haploid cell have in the case of, uh, of humans? So uh, share your, um, uh, your thoughts on the chat. Elizabeth, uh, are, are there um, courageous souls out there that are um, sharing their, um, their conclusions? There are. So William Robertson, who I'm guessing has some background in biology, was, has been the first to reply on everything. <laughs> and he says 1N is 23 and 2N is 46. He would, I'm assuming that it, if I heard the name correctly, it was William. Yeah. Uh, um, would be absolutely correct. And so if you had a similar answer as William, um, congratulations. If uh, you did not, and this particular point is um, still confusing, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me afterwards and we can talk about how we come at, um, uh, at those particular numbers. And again, uh, what we're talking about here in this particular context has to do with um, uh, chromosomes in humans but the same uh, approach can be applied as we'll see in a little bit uh, to any eukaryotic organisms that engage in um, reproduction. And so let's take a very quick look at um, the life cycle, um, the reproductive uh, cycle of humans. And uh, because we're that is going to be um, a big portion of our discussion tonight. And so what we've talked about with respect to meiosis and mitosis, the development of um, haploid gametes and development of um, a diploid zygote, which is going to differentiate and um, uh, produce cell types that will um, eventually um, create the whole human. Uh, we're gonna see a very similar process uh, with fungi, but with some really important distinctions that we're gonna take our time walking uh, ourselves through. And so again, the, um, the only haploid cells um, are, uh, are sex cells and these cells start out as diploid sex cells in our ovaries and testes, but these uh, diploid cells undergo that process of meiosis, meaning that what you end with is not what the material that you start with. Um, and so we end up with um, haploid eggs or sperm, depending on uh, whether we are male or female. And um, these cells, um, these gametes um, through sexual reproduction, and this is an important distinction um, when we talk about sex between animals and fungi, we're not talking about intercourse. That's a very different um, strategy that applies to um, uh, to animals and really uh, not so much to, to fungi as we'll see, but at the end of the day, we're still talking about uh, fertilization and the development of a diploid zygote, which will um, develop into an embryo and into a fetus, and eventually in the case of humans into um, a, a viable uh, human being. And so um, when we think about um, overall, the type of life cycle that, um, that human beings have, um, this is referred to as a diploid dominant life cycle. 
Um, most of the time we spend is in the diploid state ourselves. Um, uh, but there are um, periods of time in which some of the cells that we produce um, are in the haploid phase. Um, what you'll note um, much later on in tonight's talk is that um, we uh, in, are in very stark contrast to um, the mushroom pr producing fungi, which um, again is going to be the topic of tonight's conversation. So before we kind of now change gears a little bit and start talking about um, the real um, meat of tonight's topic, reproduction and fungi, are there any questions before we move on? Okay, um, if that changes, um, just let me know and we'll, um, we'll pause and, and deal with those. So let's move on to um, types of fungal reproduction. And so when we talk about reproduction in humans, we talk about sexual reproduction. Uh, asexual reproduction, as far as we know, um, there are purported virgin births, but um, what we're really talking about is sexual reproduction. And, um, and this can be referred to as um, perfect reproduction, at least in the case of, um, of fungi, or it has been, uh, but more appropriately is referred to as meiotic because meiosis is um, essential to um, developing those recombinant uh, cells or progeny. Um, the um, fruiting body that's produced uh, by a fungi that engage in sexual reproduction, you may have heard of before, this is um, the telomorph, and it's the telomorph um, that's the basis for uh, classification of, um, of, uh, of fungi. And so a name uh, is given to um, the, uh, the fungus that produces the sexual phase. But you do have fungi that um, not only produce sexually, but they also, or in some cases only, at least as far as we know, produce asexually. Um, this um, sort of reproduction um, uh, has been referred to as imperfect. And I think that um, this says uh, a little bit of something about the fact that uh, um, earlier mycologists um, thought of sexual reproduction as being perfect, while um, asexual uh, reproduction is being imperfect. Uh, I think it's a bit of an uh, anthrocentric position to take and uh, says a lot about uh, where they were um, at that time. Uh, but both perfect and Im imperfect are really antiquated terms and no longer used, but you may hear those um, get cycled out every once in a while. Uh, more appropriately, um, uh, asexual reproduction is referred to as mitotic because it really is cloning. It's, um, uh, there's no genetic recombination or very, very little. And uh, essentially what you're doing is, um, is cloning the organism and um, creating exact copies. And um, the uh, fruiting bodies, if you will, or fruiting structures that are produced by um, asexual fungi are referred to as the anamorphs. Um, and these are often mold-like. And um, on rare occasions, um, when both states are present, um, this sort of arrangement or construct is known as the holomorph. And so if the um, whole basis of fungal classification is on naming the um, sexually reproductive form of the fungus, um, what do you do with all the fungi that, as far as we know, don't reproduce sexually, or at least not that we've discovered so far. And what do you call the thing that um, has both phases, particularly when a label or name has been applied to the asexual phase before we found out that it was linked um, to a sexual um, cycle? Well, uh, what you do is you eliminate the, um, the asexual name and you apply the, the sexual name to the, uh, the anamorph, but that can create a whole host of problems um, that sadly we won't have time to go into much detail tonight. Um, but I do wanna say that um, 
the you know the naming of uh, of organisms based on um, their um, sexual reproductive ability, which is also known as um, the biological species con uh, concept, um, is a real challenge in this particular situation um, when fungi appear to lack asexual cycles, or when we haven't been able to link the sexual form or the asexual form to the sexual form. Um, and so the kind of workaround was to develop what's known as the form phylum deuteromycota, um, which allowed the naming of these asexual fungi um, um, kind of as a placeholder um, until or if we actually found um, the, um, the sexual phase that that particular fungus was associated with. And this existed um, for quite some time and um, you can imagine the, the difficulties of, um, you know, finding these holomorphs and realizing that um, what was once thought to be one species is now, in fact, um, at least from a taxonomic standpoint, not um, the species name. And uh, so not only are macrofungi, our mushrooms going through a, a revolution with respect to um, taxonomy and naming, our microfungi. Um, most notably the, um, the anamorphic molds um, are going through that, that same upheaval. Um, so what do you do? Well, um, I can tell you what has happened and that's um, you wait for um, DNA technology to come around um, that allows for um, uh, phylogenetic hypotheses to be tested so that um, the anamorphs can be connected to their telomorphs. And while that technology currently exists and um, these relationships are being developed, um, only about 10% of um, anamorphic, telomorphic relationships have been established. And so this leaves a, a huge gap in, in our understanding. Um, and while we may not know um, which anamorph um, belongs to which telomorph, um, we are at least, at the very least, um, able to put them in a more respectable and appropriate um, uh, classification by phylum. And so the vast majority of our anamorphic fungi or mold-like fungi belong in the phylum Ascomycota, and this is where these organisms have been placed, and to a lesser extent, uh, the Basidiomycota. So while we're talking about um, a very simplistic form of, uh, of reproduction um, and while those anamorphs don't really look like um, the telomorphs, uh, we're still talking about higher fungi and not some of the lower fungi that some of you might think that this more appropriately uh, would belong to. And so again, jettisoning the morphological um, species approach and relying um, more heavily on the phylogenetic um, and reproductive um, species approaches to delimiting um, what constitutes a species. So questions about that? I can imagine that that kind of was a bit of a head scratcher. So one person had a question of how do scientists know when to think of an organism as a holomorph? Like, are there special characteristics that that's that they that's a for? really good question. So it's not so much as thinking of it; it's a, a matter of um, uh, experiencing it. Because while in the um, the image that you see in the lower right hand corner of um, uh, hypocrea being paired with its um, uh, anamorph, uh, these particular um, phases in reproduction can be separated over both space and time. And so you might never see these occurring naturally together in nature. And so um, it is actually quite rare to find these, um, uh, the asexual and sexual phases of a fungus together on the same substrate at the same time. And so it's really through um, uh, phylogenetic approaches that we're even able to determine these. We may never see them uh, in nature, and it may only be um, through um, uh, doing DNA sequences that we can even realize that these two things are actually the same thing. So that's a really good question, one that I don't have a very satisfying answer to.
And then John Harper is asking, is the humongous fungus an example of just mitosis? Is it all uh, one organism? It or is, is there? It is all one organism. And I'm going to touch on that in just a little bit. Um, so John, thank you for the question. Um, and I will circle back to that. But yes, the, it is all just one individual. Um, and that individual is the, um, the telomorph, the sexually reproductive phase and not the um, asexual phase. And so as far as we know, um, that fungus doesn't have an asexual phase, but that's as we know it now. So when we talk about um, fungi that are reproductive um, sexually, that includes both um, uh, basidiomycetes, which by and large are as far as we know, almost exclusively sexually reproductive versus the ascomycetes, which the asexual um, reproductive phase um, is quite present, but they also, um, many of them do reproduce sexually. So, um, but we'll come back to that. Are there other questions, Elizabeth? I, I think that's it for now. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the, um, now that we've distinguished between um, the two kind of broad types of reproduction and fungi, asexual and sexual, and we'll circle back on that at least a little while, uh, or for a little while, um, let's review some of the key structures that are involved in reprodu sexual reproduction and fungi. Um, so the fruiting bodies, which you may know of as um, the Cidiomata, um, telomorphs, uh, mushrooms, there's um, thalli, um, probably some of you are going to be able to throw out some additional terms, but for tonight's discussion, I'm going to be using fruiting bodies so that it really encompasses um, all types of spore bearing um, uh, uh, fruit that the, that the fungi produce. And we by and large don't even notice the fungi that are around us until they produce their fruiting bodies. And so their fruiting bodies are in fact not the individual, um, they're the fruit. Um, you can think of this as like apples on an apple tree. The tree is the organism, the fruit are the means by which that they disperse their, their genes into the environment. And the same um, is certainly the case with uh, mushrooms and other um, sorts of fruiting bodies and fungi. So when you see a fruiting body, you know that um, it's a result of a successful reproductive sexual event. Um, these structures are responsible for producing and dispersing spores into the environment. And while not necessarily germane to tonight's topic, I do want to take a moment to address that these structures are also dumping grounds for waste that are um, accumulated in the mycelium. So while um, this particular mushroom, uh, presumably Amanita muscaria, is certainly not an edible mushroom, um, there are edible mushrooms that by all um, sense and purposes um, are good edible mushrooms, um, may not be because of the environment that they're growing in. Uh, and that's because fungi are amazing bioaccumulators. And so they are able to take in toxins and, um, and kind of ameliorate or remediate the environment, which there's been a lot of work done recently in those areas. But they can't hold on to those toxic su substances. They need to get rid of them because they're not just toxic to us, they're toxic to them too. And a way that they do that is through their fungal mycelium or through their um, fruiting bodies. So it's really important because I know a lot of you um, are avid mushroom hunters and are out there and collecting your, um, your fungi to bring home for the table, that it's not only important to know who you're collecting, but it's also really important to know where you're collecting from. Uh, because um, a delicious edible mushroom, a morel or a chanterelle that's grown in an environment that's toxic, that can uh, be transferred to you um, through the fruiting body. So um, a little bit of an aside here, but something to really keep in, keep in mind. Know the areas that you're collecting from. Take the time to figure out if there's been 
Um, and what sort of land use activity has occurred on that land before you start eating mushrooms, or at least eating them in mass? That's just will allow you to continue to enjoy fungi for a very, very long time. So, as I mentioned, the um, uh, the fruiting bodies are where the spores are produced, and these spores can act um, uh, in very similar ways to seeds. And so the spores are dispersed, they land on a suitable substrate and start producing fungal cells, these long th thread-like cells known as hypha, or hyphae. Singular is hypha, plural is hyphae. And um, these hyphae um, begin to branch and diverge and explore their environment until um, they are quite expansive um, and collectively are known as the fungal mycelium. And to at least briefly touch on John's question, um, you know, the fungal mycelium can be incredibly expansive, um, but it often escapes notice unless we're trying to answer um, specific scientific questions. Um, and to give an example that John brought up, um, the fungal mycelium can be so expansive um, that uh, it can cover uh, the diameter of a single individual, um, and this is an uh, individual that was reproduced sexually. Um, uh, the example is the humongous fungus among us, which is a type of honey mushroom um, that has been, examples of these have been found in uh, both uh, Michigan and Oregon, and in the example of the um, individual found in Oregon, uh, the diameter of that individual is um, 3.4 miles wide. Um, covering over 2,200 acres of forest. It just kind of blows your mind. Um, and so uh, these fungi, uh, the mycelium can take up um, tremendous amounts of space, but keep in mind that these cells are microscopic and um, it's only when the fungi reproduce, producing their fruit, that we see evidence um, of their presence. Uh, otherwise, um, they might go um, completely unnoticed whether that's if they're growing in the soil or growing in logs or in other substrates um, uh, in which they're using those substrates um, as their food source. Um, and this is probably a good place to point out that while we're going to talk about um, how um, genes are used in a little bit to um, determine what um, fungi are compatible with other fungi, um, it's uh, Important to note that um, this sexual compatibility is only uh, one type of compatibility that, uh, that, uh, that fungi that form these hyphal networks face. Um, and so while um, species or individuals might be sexually incompatible with uh, one another, they might also, uh, on the other hand, they might be vegetatively compatible meaning that um, their hyphae can fuse and share nutrients, which would imply that they probably have um, a, a very close genetic relationship or, or close kin uh, if the fungus is willing to share its resource, uh, resources with um, another fungus. Um, um, but they'll never um, mate. They'll never sexually reproduce, which is also another indication that they're probably very closely related. Um, you, um, fungi are not uh, any different than um, other organisms in that you want to, uh, if you're going to engage in sexual reproduction, which means you want to um, mix up and recombine your genes so that um, you have um, more diverse progeny that may be um, more able to combat um, uh, parasites and pathogens and handle um, extremes in the environment, you want to um, mix things up a bit. So reproducing sexually with um, a close kins member, not so good, but um, fusing vegetatively to share resources, that's a win. But these two systems are controlled by very different um, genetic uh, systems. But um, fungi, um, just because they're fusing uh, their hyphae, do not mean that they're engaging in sexual reproduction. Um, it could just be that they're um, uh, close relatives and uh, sharing their resources. 
Uh, I think it's interesting to note that uh, there are no sexually transmitted diseases in fungi. Um, but there are diseases that are transmitted through um, vegetative fusion. And uh, these diseases are predominantly um, viral in nature. And so um, I'm sure that there's uh, somebody out there that's um, very clever um, that can come up with a, a, a sexually transmitted disease joke about fungi. Um, unfortunately, that's just not me. So um, all this to say is that um, the, the key players involved in um, at the macro scale or sort of macro scale are our fruiting bodies, which produce spores, which produce um, hyphae that develop into mycelia. And those mycelia can engage in um, different sorts of, um, uh, of fusion. Um, some of that um, fusion can lead to um, developing uh, uh, sexually distinct progeny, while others that fuse um, really aren't engaged in anything more than um, shared nutrient allocation. So we took some time to look at the um, uh, life cycle of um, uh, the reproductive life cycle in humans. And I'd like to do the same here from kind of a, a pretty high level. Um, and so to put this together, um, and this is a very generalized uh, life cycle for fungi, and we'll look at a very, uh, a much more specific one uh, for basidiomycetes in just a little bit. Um, but as I mentioned um, uh, several slides ago, fungi are able to undergo both um, asexual and sexual reproduction, though um, some have um, lost the ability to engage in one or the other of those uh, particular types of reproduction. And as you'll soon see, um, uh, whether independent of the type of reproduction um, engaged in, uh, fungi have a, uh, evolved tightly controlled uh, genetic mechanisms to regulate um, their mating uh, processes, specifically in basidiomycetes, where it's all about sexual reproduction. Um, the sexual cycle typically involves fusion of genetically distinct hyphae. And, um, while this particular phase also exists in, um, in the human life cycle, we usually don't call it out. And that phase is known as plasmogamy. And so this is um, simply the fusion of two cells. So the plasma membranes um, of uh, two different um, uh, haploid cells um, that are genetically or that are sexually compatible fuse. And, but as opposed to, um, uh, those nuclei um, fusing immediately, what's formed instead is quite unique and really only uh, and is very characteristic of higher fungi, and that's the formation of a dicarion. Um, and that's a cell that has both nuclei from both parents present, um, and this particular phase can persist for some period of time. But when um, sexual reproduction is ready to be um, further uh, progressed. Uh, the phase known as karyogamy, which is the fusion of the two haploid nuclei to form a diploid zygote occurs. But unlike humans where the zygote is kind of the, um, the, the cell that turns into the functional progeny, um, in the case of fungi, this diploid cell undergoes meiosis. And remember meiosis, you end up with um, half of the nuclear complement that you started with in humans. That would be 46 chromosomes down to 23. Um, in uh, certain fungi like um, yeast, that would be 32 chromosomes down to 16 chromosomes. And a product of that process of meiosis is the production of um, genetically recombined haploid spores, which are dispersed into the environment if they're successful and germinate, leading to haploid mycelia. And so um, the asexual um, reproductive process by comparison is much more simple and straightforward. 
it's effectively still uh, perhaps generating from that same haploid mycelium, but the only uh, process that's in place is mitosis, and that is in effect um, cloning of the, uh, of the organism, and this process can go on indefinitely in those um, organisms, in those fungi that um, have this particular type of um, reproductive cycle. Uh, so in the simplest of terms, uh, which is uh, sexual reproduction in fungi is simply the union of uh, two compatible haploid nuclei followed by meiotic division yielding uh, recombinant haploid progeny. Uh, I say that's the simplest explanation that um, I can imagine that some of you um, might be a little bit um, confused. And so if there are questions around that, um, I'd certainly um, uh, be happy to answer them. So if you have a big mass of mycelium, are all of the cells in that mass of mycelium haploid cells? Um, they can be, and I'll touch on that in just a little bit too. But you know, you're, those are you know really good questions, and some uh, in some ways we don't have full answers for. But we'll talk about um, you know how long do um, you know basidiomycetes exist in the monokaryotic or the haploid stage or the dikaryotic stage. Um, the truthful answer is we don't really know, but we can speculate based on some of the very few examples that we have that we do know a little bit of something about. Um, are there other questions? Yeah, what's the evolutionary benefit of the dikaryon stage? Why, why, why not just go to a zygote from? That is uh, a, another excellent question. Um, and I think it um, probably can be most uh, effectively answered is that it's about um, maintaining that um, kind of, um, uh, that rare space and not recombining or not joining um, before the organism has the um, actual ability to engage in sexual reproduction reproduction, as we'll see, um, this particular process um, can be extended over um, an extensive period of time. And, um, and so conditions need to be um, uh, right for the fungus to um, spend the energy in order to produce fruiting bodies. So it allows the haploid nuclei to maintain their genetic integrity um, over an extended period of time. And so, and, and I'll elaborate on what I mean by extended period of time. We're not talking about uh, minutes, days, or hours here. We're talking about um, uh, potentially years or centuries. And so um, it's in principle about maintaining that integrity, the integrity of each parent um, without compromising um, uh, either before um, sexual reproduction is uh, moves forward. In humans, it's instantaneous. And so we're not waiting around for conditions to be right. And so there's not a lot of damage that can be done um, in that period of time. Um, fungi are very different and um, they persist in a, an environment which has a lot of uncertainty. And so um, in order to um, counteract that, the, the parental nuclei are, um, are not joined, um, at least not until conditions are um, I don't know if ideal is the right term, but until the conditions are at the very least um, appropriate and um, have the likelihood of leading to um, successful production of, of fruiting bodies. But a really good question and a pretty deep one at that. Anything this, else? This may be another preview of coming attractions, but Agnes was asking, um, where on this chart does the fruiting body start forming? Is that only as a zygote? Um, that's, an, it is a bit of a, uh, again, this is very generalized, but I will provide a very specific um, uh, life cycle for basidiomycetes that show when and where in that life cycle the fruiting body is actually produced. But just shows that uh, 
have a, a lot of really um, thoughtful and keen people out there that are paying close attention. So thank you for that question. Um, before we move on from sexual reproduction, I, I think it is worth noting that we talk about sexual reproduction in fungi and um, we can speak of it in very broad terms, but there are some important differences uh, in the types of sex that, um, uh, that fungi can engage in, at least the, the sidiomycete fungi. And so in general, there are, um, there are two types of sexual reproduction in fungi. Um, there is homothalism, um, which occurs when, um, uh, or occurs when uh, mating uh, happens within a single individual. You can think of this as um, being self-fertile. Um, so it's actually not an asexual type of reproduction, but sexual, but the um, individual organism is able to um, um, be self-fertile instead of um, the alternative, which is heterothalism. Um, and heterothalism is when hyphae from uh, a single individual is self-sterile, meaning that it can't pass on um, its nuclei to itself, and it needs to interact or mate with um, a, a compatible individual um, with um, an appropriate mating type that's genetically different enough um, in order for uh, mating to take place. And so um, tonight's discussion as we proceed on, um, it's important to note that asexual reproduction is an important part of um, many uh, life cycles of, uh, or the life cycles of many fungi. Um, and for those that do engage in sexual reproduction, um, it's not only outbreeding, um, heterothalism that occurs, but uh, inbreeding um, can also occur or, or homothalism. But for the sake of, um, even though I can't, uh, I don't think anybody would argue that this is a brief uh, conversation tonight, um, uh, we're going to focus on um, sexual reproduction and heterothalic uh, fungi going forward. So these other aspects are, are um, very important, but this is where we're headed for tonight. So how do we determine who mates with whom when we talk about Basidiomycete fungi? Um, well, Basidiomycete fungi, um, their ability to mate with one another is determined by um, uh, genes, which are known as mating type genes or MAT genes. Um, and these MAT genes um, uh, function or operate like sex chromosomes in higher eukaryotes like ourselves. Um, sex chromosomes in humans will determine um, gender, at least gender from a reproductive standpoint, um, male or female, the ability to um, uh, produce offspring or contribute to the production of offspring. Um, and these genes are, um, uh, these MAP uh, genes in fungi, they control um, compatibility between uh, sexual partners and enable um, sexually compatible haploid cells, the hyphae, um, to recognize and attract each other. So um, we'll talk about a, a couple of different types of systems uh, in, in fungi tonight. And in many of the more primitive fungi, as well as um, some of the uh, members of the ascomycota, um, these organisms only have two sexes. So some of you may have heard that um, fungi can have thousands and thousands and thousands of sexes. And that's, in fact, true, but only certain types of fungi. And we'll talk about those um, fungi that have multiple sexes, which is really more appropriately termed as mating types than sexes. But um, I'll probably go back and forth between those two terms uh, interchangeably. Um, and in um, these instances where um, uh, fungi only have two sexes, um, sexual compatibility is controlled by a single mating type gene, um, which in this uh, figure that I've put on the screen is depicted as gene A with two alleles. Um, or gene variants, if you will. So remember, um, alleles are just variants within the, in the gene. And in this particular instance, 
um, gene A has two variants, which we'll um, refer to the verse, first variant as um, the A1 allele and the second variant as the A2 allele. And it's really important to keep in mind from this point forward that fungi need, uh, in order to, um, to sexually reproduce, they need to have um, uh, mate, uh, mating type alleles that are different from each other. So in this particular scenario, um, the A1 allele can successfully rate, mate with um, a fungus that possesses the A2 allele. But if uh, a fungus encounters uh, uh, another um, individual that also has the A1 allele, it will not be able to successfully um, sexually produce. So um, in order for this to be a successful outcome from a mating standpoint, they have to have um, distinct alleles. Um, and even in this situation, um, with just two types of um, different uh, uh, alleles or mating types or sexes, um, Individuals by and large are morphologically indistinguishable from one another. And so gender is really not a construct that applies when we talk about fungi. Therefore, we need to use different terminology than male and female um, in this example. And so what I've done here is to um, label um, the first parental type strain as positive and the second parental type strain as negative. And um, this demonstrates that um, what we have here are two individuals that are um, uh, distinct genetically um, with respect to their mating types, um, but sexually compatible with one another. So when we have this sort of um, mating system, this is referred to as unifactorial because there's just a single uh, mating type gene. And as an outcome from this particular um, uh, mating event, the progeny, remember the progeny in, um, uh, as an outcome of sexual reproduction are the spores, can be one of only two mating types. And so if um, you have uh, mating type allele A1 and mating type allele A2, um, those are the only um, traits that the progeny can possibly inherit. And so in addition to this sort of mating system being um, characterized as unifactorial, it's also um, characterized as um, bipolar. And uh, as I mentioned before with the um, fungal STDs, I'm sure that there's uh, a joke out there for um, bipolar mating with uh, that being the punchline, um, again, I'm just not the right person to come up with it, but if you happen to be that person, um, please share forward. I would love to hear it um, because as you can see, uh, it is not, I'm not above uh, borrowing, if not outright stealing um, uh, clever and punchy um, uh, lines as, uh, as I already indicated um, from stealing uh, William's mushroom sluts. Um, uh, title. So if you come up with something, let me know. Um, so within this particular system of uh, one gene, two alleles, um, you're really limited in, um, so about 50% of the time, um, you're going to encounter uh, a potential mate that you can't mate with. And so um, while this certainly exists in, in fungi, um, there are um, fungi that have um, kind of taken this a step further and um, as a result of uh, mutation has developed um, a multi-allelic system, which does not limit it, limit it to just um, two mating types. In fact, um, you can have dozens, if not hundreds of different mating types in this particular scenario. And so um, for those that are not limited to just the um, A1 and A2 um, uh, alleles, you could have um, numerous variations. One example being um, an allele variant that's labeled A12 mating with an allele variant um, labeled A39. And so every combination in between. 
So as long as the, um, the partners or fund, uh, fungal individuals involved um, are interacting with um, uh, uh, a fungus that has a different um, alternate allele type, um, sexual reproduction um, can be successful. So we have those that, so in both cases, it's still a unifactorial bipolar system. Um, in the first instance, it is restricted to um, two allele types. And in the second instance, um, it could be um, anywhere between um, you know, 39 um, to several hundred different allele types, which really increases the likelihood of encountering a sexually compatible mate in the environment. And if you think about where fungi live, um, that is a significant advantage over the, um, the two allelic or two allele system um, that I mentioned before. Um, some fungi have taken this um, a bit farther, and it's not just a, a single gene that controls mating type, um, but um, two genes um, that are unlinked um, on different chromosomes. And um, this particular sort of um, mating system is known as bifactorial. Bi for two, like uni for single in the, in the previous example. Um, and um, these particular genes that are involved in um, bifactorial mating systems are labeled um, the A and B loci. And let's assume for the sake of tonight's discussion um, that there are just two alleles. We'll talk about that that's really not the um, the way things work in, in nature, but just as a starting point, let's pretend that there's um, just two alleles. So um, we have um, uh, in the um, positive parental strain, um, we have um, uh, a, the A1, B1 uh, mating type, and in the uh, minus parental strain, the A2, B2 mating type. And again, as long in, in this instance, it's not just one or the other uh, allele being different. Um, both, it's really important to know that both alleles have to be different. And so in this scenario, um, the A type alleles are different. We have one and two, and the B type alleles are different, um, B1 and B2. Um, and since um, the, um, the A and B loci or genes um, are genetically unlinked, meaning that they're on different chromosomes, independent assortment can take place, and the haploid offspring would have one of the following, potentially have one of the following mating types. Um, so you can have um, the potential progeny from this um, mating can be um, the same as the parents, A1, B1, and A2, B2, or it can also be a combination of those two, A1, B2, and A2, B1. And so you can see by looking at this that um, if um, all of the, if both um, alleles or mating type factors need to be different, that only the, um, if for some reason these fungi were to successfully um, germinate, and come in contact with each other, uh, only about um, a quarter of the fungi would actually be able to um, successfully reproduce. Those being the, um, the original um, parental type strains. Um, so A1B1 could cross with A2B2 successfully. And then the mix of the two parental type strains, uh, A1B2 and A2B1 could successfully reproduce with one another. Um, but if either of those factors are shared, um, uh, so for example, A1B1 would not be able to successfully reproduce with a fungus that has the mating type A1B2 because the A factors are shared. So um, uh, fungi that have this sort of um, uh, bifactorial mating system, again, um, one of four mating types um, can be produced, and this is also in addition to being referred to as bifactorial, um, is also known as a tetrapolar mating system. 
and I know we're getting into pretty um, deep stuff here. Um, we're not going to spend too much more time uh, on the genetic side of things, but it's, um, it's important to note that in reality, um, there are usually more than two alleles um, at any one locus, and um, each individual is um, compatible with any individual of an opposite mating type. And um, if you recall the very first slide, my opening slide that has um, schizophilum commune uh, uh, depicted, this is a ubiquitous fungus, which at one point we thought was all of, uh, was a single species, and we're finding out that that's not entirely true. Uh, but for the purposes of tonight's talk, we're going to um, talk about um, this complex as a, 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 a single um, species. Um, and for this particular fungus, um, there are more than 300 uh, alleles of the A locus and more than 90 known alleles for the B locus. And this results in um, well over 20,000 different mating types for this single fungus alone. And so um, when I mentioned that um, uh, the split gill is the slut of the mushroom world, um, that's really not an understatement because it can effectively um, reproduce with practically almost any um, uh, uh, other split gill that it comes in contact with. There are rare occasions where that's not going to happen, but because of the abundance of different um, uh, mating types, it's almost guaranteed, not quite 100%, but pretty darn close to 100% that it can uh, reproduce um, successfully with um, almost any other split gill that it comes in contact with. So um, how are you all doing? You hanging in there? You, um, you feeling a little worn out? Um, we okay to go on? We need to kind of reconnect around some of these concepts. I think we probably want to sort of sort of wind down here in the next um, ten or fifteen minutes. Uh, oh, sure. yeah. I just uh, I. I'm fine with going on. I'm just, uh, you asked for some feedback and I think it's, it's probably um, time to think about winding down a little bit. Okay, well, let's move one, on. One question though, um, just uh, even without being a slut, uh, wouldn't just, you know, if you had the right conditions, statistically, even with this sort of, um, you know, by factorial uh, replication, wouldn't you at some point sort of have a, you know, this organism that's sort of like a, you know, autocatalytic set of itself uh, that just keeps growing? Is that what the humongous fungus is? No, um, the humongous fungus is a um, by factorial organism, um, but it's, not really so much um, because it's um, bifactorial that it's able to um, expand so extensively. That's more of an inherent nature to fungi in general. Um, and so um, I'm not entirely sure um, what you're driving at. Um, so perhaps you could formulate that uh, a little bit differently for me. That may have to wait till next time. I'm, I'll have to work on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit, very briefly, about what these genes actually do. Do besides, you know, you need to have different sets of them in order to be compatible. What G, well, um, in the broadest sense, gene A controls development of um, specialized hyphal structures known as clamp connections. Um, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And um, gene B regulates the exchange of nuclei between um, the two partners and encodes for pheromone and receptor systems, which are essentially the, um, how, you, how a fungus um, uh, recognizes a potential mate and is able to um, uh, mate with that particular individual. So, um, 
And as a reminder, both loci are necessary for a successful mating. So um, we've talked about these various cycle, these various um, steps in sexual reproduction um, already. And I know that the talks of genes and mating types um, can be a bit overwhelming. Um, but a lot of what we're going to talk about going forward, you've already heard about, at least in some fashion. And so um, it's important to know that um, essentially in all fungi that engage in sexual reproduction, it really boils down to fertilization and meiosis. And in most eukary eukaryotic organisms like ourselves, we only talk about fertilization, um, which is the process of plasmogamy, plasmogamy or cell fusion, immediately followed by karyogamy, which is the um, process of uh, nuclear fusion. But in higher fungi, these two events can be separated in time. And as I mentioned earlier, this time can be over um, an extensive period of time. Um, in some cases, hours or days, um, but um, more often, at least as we understand it, um, years to potentially centuries. Um, so let's start out with our monokaryotic hyphae. Um, these are haploid. And when they fuse in the process of plasmogamy, they form what's known as a dikaryon or dikaryotic hyphae, meaning that um, those individual parental nuclei don't fuse, and this is um, referred to as the N plus N stage. And when the um, fungus is ready to um, finalize its reproductive um, cycle, karyogamy occurs, producing um, a diploid zygote. And um, in just a moment, I will talk about um, where that, zip, that diploid zygote actually occurs with respect to, are we talking about the below ground or substrate mycelium or the fungal fruiting body? So let's start with um, a, a generalized life cycle of um, the split gill fungus and begin with uh, spore germination. And so the haploid spore germinates, producing haploid monokaryotic mycelium. Um, this individual is um, kind of collectively referred to as the monokaryon. And if, if and when it encounters um, a sexually compatible monokaryon, those um, two fungi can engage in uh, sexual reprodu reproduction, producing a dikaryotic mycelium. And this dikaryotic condition in many basidiomycetes is maintained through um, a process of developing what's known uh, as clamp connections. Um, and I will quickly go through this particular um, process. Um, if you have questions, we can um, address them at the end of tonight's talk. And so, in maintaining the dikaryotic condition, you can imagine that as um, fungal cells um, divide and replicate, it's really important to make, make sure that with each cellular division that the nuclei from both parents are maintained, that you don't um, accidentally just begin um, replicating one uh, set of parental nuclei over the other. We wanna make sure that both are carried forward throughout the organism. And so in many basidiomycetes, this um, is accomplished through the formation of clamp connections. And these clamp connections are little projections that come out of the sidewall of the um, growing or elongating hyphal tip. And the nuclei, one nuclei of the, um, uh, of the dikaryotic pair migrates into the, the clamp. Um, and it's at this point that both of the nuclei um, uh, uh, divide through mitosis, producing identical copies. Uh, following this, there are cross walls or septa that, um, that are um, developed that prevent those um, newly developed nuclei from being contaminated, if you will, from either the, um, the nucleus that's present in the forming clamp or the, um, the other parental nucleus on the other dividing wall. And 
um, once those uh, uh, two uh, nuclei are successfully separated, that clamp connection continues to grow until it comes in, it kind of bends down and comes in contact with the, um, the uh, hyphal cell wall and those uh, plasma membranes uh, merge and the, the nuclei that was once in the clamp kind of gets dumped out and, um, and falls back into um, the cell behind the newly formed um, cell with the newly formed um, uh, dikaryotic um, cellular condition. And so um, while not all basidiomycetes um, form clamp connections, again, there are um, differences. Um, what we do know is when we see clamp connections, um, we know that we have a basidiomycete and not any other type of fungus. Um, so now let's take a closer look at the specific stages um, of the basidiomycete um, fungal life cycle. And the fruiting body um, is, um, it's important to remember that the fruiting body is derived from the um, heterokaryotic mycelium that's growing within the substrate. Um, and so the mycelium is dikaryotic and therefore the fruiting body or basidio um, carp is also dikaryotic. Um, and the process of differentiating those um, dikaryotic uh, mycelial cells um, into a fully formed and functioning uh, fruiting body is uh, governed by a, a different set of um, genes that um, allow that mycelium to differentiate into um, the fruiting body that you see, whether that's a, um, a gilled mushroom, a poured mushroom, or something else. Um, and the, the fruiting bodies um, are developed in response to external stimuli, um, physical and chemical stimuli from the environment, and include a wide variety of different sorts of um, signals that um, can be anything from um, light and carbon dioxide and temperature and moisture, um, along with interactions that these uh, fungi have between other fungi that are inhabiting the same uh, environment or ecological niche, as long as with um, uh, organisms that can be potential um, predators or pathogens, including uh, bacteria and insects. And so um, to get to Agnes's question about, you know, where the heck are these um, um, cells that uh, produce the, the spores um, developed, it's um, on the edges of the gills or pores in this example where we will see the development of um, specialized uh, reproductive cells known as basidia. And it's these basidia from which the basidiospores are derived. And um, you may have heard that this fertile layer um, in fungi uh, is referred to as the hymenium. So let's take just a very quick moment and I will um, go through these slides very quickly for the sake of time, but let's take a moment to step away from the life cycles um, to discuss the relationship between um, the um, spore producing surface area and reproduction. So fungi can't move around, at least not like um, animals do, but they still need to disperse their spores um, so that they can colonize new habitats um, and engage in their reproductive cycle um, uh, as we've already descri described. The chance of actually um, landing on uh, an appropriate um, substrate um, is actually very, very low. And so most fungi, um, have to produce uh, millions, if not billions, uh, of spores in order to accomplish um, this task of passing on their genes to the next generation. Uh, and fungi have um, developed many ways of increasing their spore-bearing surface or the hymenium of their fruiting bodies. So let's take um, really a, a very quick glance at um, how uh, many fungi from the basidiomycetes have accomplished that. And so, um, some fungi have developed gills, 
um, which allow uh, an increase of the surface area by at least 100 times compared to a surface that would be smooth. Pores, um, pores in fungi can be found in both uh, polypores and boletes. And from an evolutionary standpoint, these are these um, different strategies probably arose independently of one another and would be a really good example of convergent evolution. Um, I have pores question mark because they don't really um, look like that in Dedalia quercina or the oak maize gill. Um, they look more like gills, but are in fact um, um, elongated pores. Um, we saw an example of um, Flebia earlier. Um, this is uh, Flebia um, tremulosa, um, and the spore surface has become highly convoluted and folded. Um, and in the case of Peniophora rufra, the red um, tree brain fungus, um, it's known for its um, deeply wrinkled uh, surface, which again increases the surface area for spore production. And probably one, if not my favorite edible, uh, Hygnum repandum has downward pointing teeth that increases its surface area. Um, in the case of bear's head um, tooth fungus, um, it has long spines instead of teeth. Um, and as Mitch uh, mentioned, these are out and about in Virginia, not so much up here in the Finger Lakes. Um, chanterelles don't have true gills, but have blunt ridges instead that serve to increase the surface area. While the black trumpet, um, not really um, blunt ridges, but more veiny. And um, you'll see a lot of different crusts out there, like um, this um, beautiful um, uh, Pulchercherium ceruleum. Um, while it has a smooth um, uh, spore bearing surface, so not really using um, surface area um, to produce a lot of spores, it has the unique attribute um, and is able to compensate for that lack of surface area by being able to dry out and revive many times during the growing season. So it can produce uh, uh, an abundance of spores despite the lack of surface area. Um, and in coral fungi, um, that entire surface is completely covered by um, basidia um, that are able to produce basidia spores. So um, while it looks like it doesn't belong on land, but in the sea, um, it's a really clever strategy for um, producing a lot of spores. And of course, there are others. There's a whole variety of different approaches. And the one that I presented here, um, a puffball, is effectively um, a ball that is nothing but spores on the inside, um, allowing for um, spores to be uh, produced and dispersed over um, a, a wide uh, range. And all of those spores are going to be unique to one another, have um, very genetic or very different um, uh, genetic profiles compared to one another. So um, we're going to wrap things up um, pretty quickly here. Um, for time. And um, so we've talked about plasmogamy, which is the fusion of, um, of hyphae. But what hasn't happened yet is the nuclei has, have not fused um, to develop a, um, a diploid zygote. And so where does this karyogamy occur? And karyogamy occurs in one cell type and one cell type only, and that's the basidia. The basidia that line the gills and pores and ridges and uh, branches of uh, the fungi that we just looked at. Um, this is where karyogamy occurs. So the um, two haploid nuclei join, and pretty quickly, so while um, the basidia go through being heterokaryotic to diploid, um, they transition from being diploid very quickly by going through uh, mitotic cell division. And through this um, process, develop our four haploid basidia spore nuclei, which are um, transferred very um, via these um, thin projections um, at the tip of the basidia um, into um, the um, basidia spore primordia. And from there, um, once those spores mature, they are released into the environment and um, the process begins once again. So as I promised, 
here is what the basidiomycete life cycle looks like in its full glory. So we've taken each one of these various steps a piece at a time to try and uh, digest and um, think about how all, each of these stages proceed um, from one step to the next. So let's recap and um, take a quick look at all of the steps involved. So let's begin um, right with the number one on the, um, the life cycle diagram where we have our two haploid uh, mycelia um, that are of opposite but compatible mating types coming in, uh, being recognized and um, uh, being able to engage in the, um, uh, the process of plasmogamy. So that uh, fusion of hyphal cells, which results in uh, dikaryotic mycelium and in the case of many basidiomycete fungi, um, that heterokaryotic condition is maintained through the process of developing clamp connections. Um, when conditions are right and appropriate, and this can be um, uh, many, many years after that heterokaryotic mycelia is, um, mycelium is initially formed, uh, fruiting bodies can be produced. And it's on these fruiting bodies, on the hymenium, whether that hymenium is gills or pores, et cetera. Basidia are produced. Those basidia too are heterokaryotic until they engage in uh, nuclear fusion or karyogony, developing uh, into diploid zygotes. Those diploid zygotes then almost instantaneously engage in meiosis, resulting in uh, basidia that contain four genetically recombined haploid nuclei, which those nuclei are then passed on to the spores. And the spores are then, once they are mature, are released and the process begins again. So when we started, we talked about um, the human reproductive cycle and how it, um, so that we could kind of have this foundation or relationship with um, what we would be talking about going forward. And we ended with um, a predominantly di dikaryotic life cycle, um, very complex, um, involving multiple cell types um, in which we um, not only have both um, diploid and haploid phases, but um, a nuclear condition which is unique to kingdom fungi, and that is the um, dikaryotic condition. So when you look at your fellow humans, you know that you're looking at a predominantly diploid organism. When you look at your mushrooms in the environment, they are not diploid like you. They're really hetero or dikaryotic, um, which is a very different sort of um, uh, cellular condition compared to ourselves. So I want to thank you all for your attention and uh, I appreciate you. If you've stuck with it this far, thank you so much. And um, I'm happy to any, answer any questions um, if, there's, uh, if there's time to do so. So thank you. Thank you very much. And are there any, are there any other questions we can uh, entertain as many as you want to pose that have not been asked? I'm not seeing any in the chat yet, but um, lots of praise for that last um, cycle slide that help really helped bring it all together. Uh, here's one. Are basidia mycetes generally gilled? Um, no, in fact, um, I don't have a breakdown of how many fungi fall into um, the gilled category versus um, the pored category versus the folded hymenium, et cetera. Um, but it's often the, the model when we talk about the Cidiomycete fungi. We, there, it's usually the um, representation as being a gilled fungus. But what's the actual breakdown between those different hymenial types? I'm not sure. But it sure seems like we encounter a lot of them when we, when we walk around in the forest. But um, I, wouldn't, I really couldn't tell you what the, the breakdown is.
So all the photos of fungi that you showed toward the end of your presentation were all Basidiomyces, right? Yes. Yeah. So all those different strategies for increasing the pore surface. Yes, exactly. And so um, again, the guild fungus is the <laughs> model that's often used, but it's not limited to those. And there are a lot of other ones that um, many of you can probably think of that were not included uh, in that um, little walk through, um, you know, the mushroom producing the city of my seats. Um, you know, there were, I didn't put any stink horns or anything like, in, like that in there. And there's certainly others as well that I did not include. Okay, well, I, I think we're uh, probably about time to retire here. So again, I want to uh, particularly thank you, Shannon, for covering a extremely difficult subject. Woody Allen would be proud. <laughs> Everything you wanted to know about mushroom sex, but we're afraid to ask. And that's uh, the city of my seats, folks. In great um, detail. You put the, uh, it, given the, the, the mushroom mating types, I think the LGBT community would probably run out of, uh, run out of alphabet pretty soon with the, the whole discussion that goes on with mushrooms and-, and Yeah, yeah, the gender construct is not really day. applicable, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, well, mating types are another way to look at life, I guess. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, so I, we're gonna sign off. Um, thank you all for attending and hanging in there with uh, a extremely uh, absorbing subject. And uh, welcome to come back next month for the Russ and Smuts to go with the uh, Russ and Sluts. <laughs> <laughs>